Join us for a fascinating visit with the Moroccan Americans. This week, we'll get a glimpse of Morocco's beautiful lands and learn more about the people's diverse heritage, deep history, and determined spirit. Whether savoring home-cooked couscous or mingling at a Moroccan mixer, come see why Morocco's culture is worth a second look. Coming up next on World in America. While Morocco dates its independence back only to 1956, when it became free from both Spanish and French rule, the lands of present-day Morocco have been inhabited since at least 8,000 BC. Located in northwest Africa, the country shares a border with Mauritania, Algeria, and Spain. Its long coastline traces the Atlantic Ocean on the west and reaches north past the Strait of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean Sea. Most of Morocco's population comes from mixed Arab Berber descent and practices Islam. Morocco's long history and strategic coastline have established it as a land of rich cultural heritage. Arab, Berber, Moorish, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, African, and Jewish influences all left their mark and have contributed to Morocco's amazing cuisine, lively music, and colorful arts. Each of Morocco's bustling cities offers up a different slice of Moroccan culture. Whether speaking of Rabat's government, Casablanca's ports, the medieval walls of Fez, Tangier's Spanish gateway, or Marrakesh's melting pot, the country moves easily between its many diverse identities. The positive relationship between Morocco and the United States date back to the 18th century, when Morocco became the first to recognize the United States as an independent nation. The Moroccan-American Treaty of Friendship signed by John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, remains America's oldest non-broken friendship treaty. The mutual respect between these two countries continues today, carried on through educational exchanges and other cultural programs. Although a few Moroccans came to America during the early years of its history, Moroccan presence in the U.S. was generally limited until the mid-1900s. Given their proximity and access to Europe, it was historically more common for Moroccans to immigrate across the Strait of Gibraltar than it was for them to travel to the States. So when the Moroccans did arrive, it was because they had made a deliberate choice to be part of American society. Moroccan Americans are, to me, a very special uh, term to us because uh, we immigrated to the United States of America uh, very recently, um, very different than the Irish Americans or Jewish Americans. Uh, but the Moroccan American is a person who uh, uh, particularly chose America uh, as a second home because of many reasons. A lot of us choose them for uh, education, others for a better future. Uh, but a Moroccan American is a person who uh, decided to cross this Atlantic Ocean to come to America as a new world 
and defy the uh, normal immigration uh, for Moroccans to Europe. So Moroccan American is, uh, uh, is a person who made a choice to come to America to uh, experience a very different culture, very different uh, interaction with the West. Most Moroccans came to the States looking to expand their education or to find employment in the professional sector. They came in, in different waves and the first waves were very historical, very old to, to, to uh, analyze or record it. Uh, but there were some uh, very rare experiences in the 20s and the 30s. The Jewish Moroccans came here and, and then in the 80s uh, that's where a bulk a uh, number of Moroccans came uh, to America. By the late 1990s, a large percentage of Moroccans were students or recent university graduates. In general, the number of Moroccan immigrants remains relatively low. In the 90s, mostly students, and I would say from the 90s until now, uh, the lottery, uh, uh, diversity visa uh, process that America introduced uh, helped a lot of Moroccans to uh, achieve the goal of coming to America and uh, they were I, th I think immigrating by a rate of 5,000 per year. Different cultures always present new challenges and language is of course one of the greatest. While Moroccans are frequently multilingual many already speak Arabic and French immigrants face the task of perfecting English before their arrival. Moroccans uh, faced a lot of challenges that they came uh, either in the 80s or 60s or, or 90s or until today. Uh, they still face a lot of uh, obstacles. Well, if you're a, a Moroccan, you would come here and uh, first of all, you have a language barrier. Uh, you know, we, are, we speak Moroccan, which is based on Arabic and a mixture of French and Spanish. And we speak French as a second language. So when you come to the United States of America, you are required to either uh, to speak pretty good English. Uh, it's, it's not a given for everybody. Although they were committed to maintaining their identity through language, culture, and religion, the Moroccans found that they could adapt well enough within American society. You know, it's not an Islamic country, but it is tolerant enough for Moroccans to worship uh, freely, I believe. Uh, so that's why, uh, from my personal experience, I think that uh, the challenges were mostly to uh, integrate and to be part of the society rather than to live uh, on the sides of the society. Moroccan immigrants demonstrated great resiliency. Not only did they recognize the challenges they would encounter, they were determined to overcome them and integrate into their new home country. A lot of immigrants make the mistake of just living in parallel to American society. I refuse to do that, and uh, a lot of Moroccans also uh, feel the same way. And they went ahead uh, to uh, acquire college degrees and uh, to learn more about American culture and to integrate into the market and to be productive citizen of this country by staying as Moroccan as they can. Challenges are there, uh, we're still facing them as we faced them in the 80s and 90s, but Moroccans, I think, are doing a pretty good job in integrating into the American society. When we return, we'll make a visit to the Moroccan American Cultural Center in Washington, D.C. to learn how the Moroccans have established themselves in educational and professional roles. We'll also get our first taste of Morocco's diverse and lively culture, coming up next on World in America. We're back with more World in America. Welcome to the Moroccan American Cultural Center, located in the heart of Washington, D.C. The center sponsors events and programs designed to introduce Moroccan culture to a wider audience. Established in 2003 as an initiative of Morocco's King Mohammed VI, 
Its stated mission is to build strong cultural and educational ties between Morocco and the United States. Here at the center, we have three kinds of programs. One is to promote educational and cultural programs between the United States and Morocco by providing grants to people who do, do programs, for example, cultural programs where artists will come from Morocco to the United States and they'll be hosted by a U.S. organization. We will give a grant to that organization to make sure that they get the most exposure they can while they're in the United States. Although the center runs numerous programs, one of its primary goals is to function as a cultural exchange resource, providing opportunities for American individuals and institutions to gain familiarity with Moroccan culture. We also do educational programs. For example, we have just had a group of American uh, student advisors come back from Morocco, and their job is to help promote study abroad programs. So they, we sent them to Morocco so they would learn about Morocco so they could come back and encourage students to go to Morocco for summer programs or for semester programs. Educational exchanges offer an opportunity to establish relationships, experience culture, and spark interest in Morocco's rich heritage. These programs help keep alive the long tradition of friendship between the two countries. The third area we work in is uh, educational and intellectual information programs where we uh, work with, for example, the Maghreb Center at Georgetown or the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington to help support speakers and support research on uh, Morocco and also the greater North Africa, the Maghreb region. And all of this is valuable work since Morocco's culture is a treasure trove of deep history, delicious food, and diverse influences. Yeah, the Moroccan culture is very much focused on the family. And not just the family, but the larger groups, the tribes and the clans. And so there are very specific uh, groupings in Morocco that have very strong cultural identities. In the south we have the Sahrawi culture, for example. In the central we have the Rif culture. And in the north we have the Tangier culture. And then of course Casablanca and Rabat are more urban cultures. So there are a number of different cultural styles in Morocco, cultural groups that have their own defined uh, way in which they have their music, in which they have their dance, in which they have foods. And so what we try to do is create opportunities to expand the knowledge of this diversity in Morocco in the United States. Morocco's music embodies the best of all its myriad ethnic groups. While Arab sounds predominate, you'll also hear Andalusian and other styles. Chabi is one popular modern form descending from folk music. It's known for combining older instruments such as lutes with the electric guitars and keyboards. Morocco is very vibrant in terms of music. Uh, I think the government decided uh, more than 10 years ago that music was a great way to draw tourists to Morocco. And so, for example, they have the Sacred Music Festival in Morocco, they have the Ganawa Festival in Aswira every year, and these draw people from all over the world, not just from Africa and North Africa. When World in America returns, we'll mingle at a Moroccan-style mixer and savor home-cooked couscous at one of New York's most delicious Moroccan restaurants. Coming up on World in America. We're back with more World in America. What better way to learn a country's customs than by mingling at an easygoing mixer? Here at the Foundation for Middle East Peace in Washington, D.C., young professionals have gathered for casual conversation, good times, and a taste of Moroccan culture. Oh, the Middle East Institute is one of the very oldest think tanks uh, in Washington, D.C. We were founded over 60 years ago, um, and our mission is very simple. It's to uh, promote understanding and knowledge about the Middle East to the American people and vice versa. So this kind of event that we're holding today is uh, very much in line with our mission. Well, we've, we're hosting this uh, event. Uh, we call it Talk Souk. It's a, uh, a mixer for young people. We're hosting it with the um, American Morocco Center and the uh, Moroccan Embassy. Um, but we've invited uh, young people from 
the embassies, uh, uh, Americans of uh, Middle Eastern um, um, families to come and meet with each other and talk about their culture, um, do henna on their hands, listen to a wonderful Moroccan band, um, have Moroccan food uh, a, a, on a hot uh, summer Washington evening. Uh, well, basically, it's a social event, it's a networking event for uh, young professionals. So you have people from all over DC who are just, you know, looking to have a good time, network, meet new people. We have a lot of people from embassies too, so it's a lot of diplomats. Um, so yeah, it's a bit very laid back, you know, there's entertainment, there's food, there's shisha. So it's just a very, you know, casual event, nothing formal. The traditional activities wouldn't be complete without an example of gorgeously intricate henna body art. Used by women for centuries to decorate their bodies for special occasions, the designs are created with a paste derived from the henna plant which stains the skin's outer layer and can linger for weeks. Uh, you take the leaves and then you crush it and if, if you put it on, you can put it on some sort of design and if you leave it on for a while, it stains your hand. So as in like, you know, it'll leave that imprint on your hand. Um, very popular during Eid and weddings, so it's, you know, just sort of like decorative purposes. You know, I'm going to a wedding tomorrow. I really should have done it on my hand. It's something that, of course, in the Moroccan culture, is very traditional, particularly at times of weddings. I have uh, Indian friends, and I know that they use uh, henna for when there's a wedding or, or something like that, but I've never gotten it done myself. So that's why when I heard that they were doing it here, I really wanted to get it. So, and it looks so beautiful. It's a zina, you know, it's a zina, it's like um, um, makeup, some sort of makeup for women, for brides usually, and we do this uh, for uh, not only uh, weddings, but also when it's like the Eid, the peace, you know. And to accompany the arts, there's music. These musicians are creating traditional sounds with modern instruments, and their singing style is representative of what's commonly heard throughout Morocco. The Middle East Institute is an old institution, over 60 years old, but um, we're, we're focusing uh, many of our programs on youth, on young people. 65% uh, of the people throughout the Middle East and North Africa are under the age of 35. So we've invited people to this event who are in that age group, or age cohorts. Uh, our belief is that if we're to encourage understanding between the Middle East peoples and the people of the United States, Let's talk to the majorities. Here at Babouche Restaurant in New York City, both Moroccans and non-Moroccans alike come for a taste of the good life. Babouche serves up top-notch modern cuisine that mix authentic flavors with contemporary style. The result? Moroccan food with an upscale French flair. The idea was to create a restaurant but with a very um, a guest house. And the way like you enter in a guest house in Morocco, you put the babouches. And the idea was not Yes, to build up a restaurant, but not, you know, really, you know, to have a feel like you are in somebody else's home.
Moroccan cuisine is one of the most diverse in the world, combining influences from Arab, Berber, Moorish, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, African, and Jewish cooking. Building on staples such as chicken, lamb, and couscous, Moroccan food adds a wide range of spices, including cinnamon, cumin, turmeric, ginger, paprika, parsley, saffron, and mint. Other essential ingredients include almonds, pistachios, apricots, raisins, figs, and honey. I mean, first of all, I will tell you that the Moroccan cuisine is one of the best, or at least well known, in the world. You can eat sweet, you can eat spicy, you can eat, um, and also very healthy. A lot of vegetables involved, a lot of spices involved. One item always graces a Moroccan menu, couscous. Both nutritious and delicious, this tiny pasta is made from moistened semolina wheat coated with finely ground wheat flour. Thank you for coming to Babouche Restaurant. We have the presence of our chef, Rashida Radi. She will introduce you right now how to make the couscous. Then the couscous, it's a molina. We're going to put some olive oil, some salt, and she's going to, Rashida, and she's going to mix all the ingredients together. While Westerners may be familiar with the processed quick cook couscous found in stores, traditional couscous requires considerable preparation time. While it may seem like a simple dish, making couscous is an incredibly time-intensive process, and at Babouche, they don't cut corners. The granules are first mixed with water to moisten them. Next, they're steamed for 45 minutes to let the semolina expand. In this instance, They'll repeat the steaming process multiple times. Properly cooked couscous should be light and fluffy before it's ready to be served. Couscous is traditionally served with a meat or a vegetable stew, but it can also be eaten plain, warm, cold, for dessert, or as a side dish. Once the preparation is complete, the possibilities are endless. We're going to let the couscous stay inside for about... about about 45 minutes and then we're going to repeat the same action three times before we give it to the customer. Our customer today, they are from all over the place. They are Americans, of course, they are French, they are East of Europe, they are Russian. They are, you see, to have come to America and to have built up a Moroccan restaurant was also to send a message. We also have strong values, such as the decor, such as the food, such as um, the hospitality. Now she's going to show us how to make the lamb tagine. In Moroccan cooking, the term tazine refers to slow-cooked stews that feature aromatic vegetables and sauce. The dish is named after the clay pot in which it's traditionally prepared. For this lamb tazine, spices such as turmeric, cumin, and cinnamon create the base. So mix it, everything. We're adding the lamb. The wonderful thing about tazines is that they can be adjusted for available ingredients and seasoned according to taste. We're going to put some onion. Like most Moroccan recipes, this lamb tazine combines both sweet and savory flavors together in one dish. Then we're going to leave it on the fire for about 30 minutes. And finally, we have the tagine lamb tagine, chunk of lamb with the prunes and sesame seed with a um, sauteed onion. Although the Moroccan Americans may not be the largest immigrant group, they've certainly established themselves as a vital part of this country. It's interesting to talk about Moroccan Americans because they are like every other serious immigrant to the United States. 
They're hardworking, they're ambitious, they're trying to balance their family and their work, and they're people who want to make a difference here in the United States and at home. But I think what's really important to them is they're really loyal. They're really loyal um, in many different ways. They're loyal to their culture, their language, their food, you know, all that. But they're also loyal to this country in the sense that they want good things for the United States. And so I see a real commitment on their part to educate other Americans about Arabs and Muslims and the Middle East and, and what's really going on there. And that's really important.